Amen. Hey, Steve, do we have any more of the bulletins or anything back there? Do you see if there's any extra? So we're going to be in the book of Acts today. We're continuing in this series on Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is where we're going to be. We did, uh, we're going to have three themes around Acts chapter 1 verse 8. No? Okay. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. If you have a bulletin, you want to one near you, I don't need one. Just see if anybody needed one. Uh, make sure you have one or if you, if there's going to be a lot of scriptures around uh, the text today or, or the sermon today. So it's in the bulletin if you want to follow along with those. But Acts chapter 1 verse we started it last week. We're going to look at it again today and next week with a different theme each week from that verse. And then we're going to bounce to a number of places related to that theme. Let me just, before we do that, remind you, and, and if you weren't here last week, tell you for the first time, or if you didn't see it on the email this week. But through this month and next month, what I would like to encourage us to do is to read the book of Acts together. So that each day we're reading the same chapters as a church, or well, let me put chapter as a church. So, to, for instance, today, if you're following along, what chapter are we on? Five. Five. We just have to make sure I have the day right, I guess. My next question was going to be, how do I? How did you know that? Because it's the day. So whatever day of the month that we're on, that's the chapter in the book of Acts we're going to be in. Some of you are really quick Bible students, and you know the calendar really well, and you realize there's only 28 chapters in the book of Acts, and yet there's 29, 30, 31 days in August, in January. I'm fast forwarding things. I'm ready. I'm done. Ready to move forward. Um, there's a, there's 31 days. So what do I do when I get to chapter 29? There is no chapter 29. What do I do at day 29? Everything that everyone just said is the right answer. See how easy this is? I think I heard like start over, read, review. I would encourage you, what I'd like to encourage you is read the highlights. And now you're asking me, well, what highlights? The highlights that you're making in your Bible. Some of you are like, but I don't believe in writing in the Bible. Buy a notebook, buy a journal, and write something down that you've been reading each day. Make some notes. And then at those last few days, I think it would be a great exercise to go back through and reread those highlights. Let me just say, because I said it in first service real quickly, though, because I did notice I ran out of time in the first service. But real quickly, just as a side thing, if you're not one who does note or highlight, I really encourage you to, to think about that. If you're, it's, now, if you're doing, if you absolutely don't want to do it because I don't believe this is the word of God, I don't believe you should touch it and write in it. I mean, I'm not going to argue with on, on that one. I write in this thing like crazy. I love it. I love writing in it. I love highlighting in it. And it is a wonderful treasure and gift. Um, I wanted to say, make a little more of a comment, but I didn't know, I didn't want to embarrass her too much, but my 13 year old, my new 13 year old, Hannah, was holding my old Bible for five years. I've had that Bible. I've been writing it and highlighting it. When she turned 13, I, I, I gave it to her. That was the, the goal of that Bible. And the Bible had before that for five years, I wrote it and highlighted it and marked it all up. And when Maria turned 13, who's now almost 18, I gave Maria that Bible. This Bible I just got, um, it has somebody had mess, mess text me a picture, or maybe gave me this picture. Did you give me this one, Mark, Mark Donna or somebody? Uh, me and uh, Tyler and I at the altar praying. This Bible for the next five years will be, this is Tyler's Bible. Um, I'm going to be writing in it. I'm going to be highlighting in it and marking it up, and I'm going to give it to him. I noticed in first service, Hannah was sitting there with that Bible. And that's special to me. Those are wonderful gifts, wonderful treasures. When I do a funeral, I always ask, Do uh, did the, as a believer, did they have a Bible? Did, did they write it? I would love to see their Bible. I would love to just take a look at what they were noting and what they were highlighting. It's a wonderful, wonderful um, way to study scripture, but it is a wonderful treasure to pass along to other people and future generations to, to love the word of God and to be able to share that with, with generations to come. Make sense? Thought? And I love it. I encourage you to do that. I, uh, I just challenge you with it. And during these next two months to be reading Acts chapter 5 today, read just one chapter. I encourage you to read one chapter. Don't go further than that. Just spend time. And I encourage you, if you have the extra time, maybe you're used to reading three and four chapters at once, reread that same chapter throughout the day. Read it two or three times. Read the highlights. Just allow ourselves to linger in a small portion of Scripture and ask questions of that text. God, what, what, what's happening in this text? What, what were you saying to the people then? What are you saying to me today? What do I need to get out of this word today that I need to hear to guide my life and my walk as a believer. I'm praying that we as a church 
start this year off in, in I can't think any better way, but to immerse ourselves together in the word of God and in Jesus Christ in relationship with him and to be led and to be moved by the Holy Spirit of God, which we're going to talk about now. Make sense? Good. Everybody on the same page? Tracking? Agree? I don't care if you disagree. Let's, let's do it together. And then last thing, and when we get to February, February 1, let's start over at Acts 1. So January and February, let's read all of Acts twice together and look at our highlights. Encourage one another with this. Pray for one another. Share notes. Go to a coffee shop and talk about greater things than uh, whatever else has happened in the world and, and say, but here's what I've been reading. What have you been reading? Uh, let's do that together. Exciting? Good? Everybody good? Happy New Year? Ready to roll? I got a lot of stuff. The, the cool thing is if I look at the clock like this, I, I can't see it. So I have no idea what time it is right now. I'm just going to keep doing it this way. And then when you got to go, just go. And when I don't hear anyone, I'll know we're done. <laughs> yeah. It is, it is gospel truth when Jesus said, let the little children come to me because children have wisdom beyond any of our years. Amen. She knew, she heard, she heard exactly what was going on there. So I, I appreciate that. And the beauty is I don't have to pay her. <laughs> Because money means nothing. I have to pay you all. I have to randomly sprinkle people to say amens and stuff. It costs me a fortune to preach and get some people. All right, I'm, I'm teasing. All right, here we go. We, I gotta, we got to focus. Help me focus today, church and, and Lord. Um, where are we? Acts 1-8. Here we go. Acts 1 8. So last week we read this. Let's read it again, and we're going to do it again next week and looking at three different themes. Acts 1 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Last week we looked at that portion of the challenge or the call to you will be my witnesses, right? Witnesses to what? Yeah, witnesses to the resurrection. We saw it again and again and again. So here's your marching orders. It's, and, and a lot of specifics and details to each person or the church in general, but uh, but to the church in general, to the disciples, you, you're going to be my witnesses, witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ this week. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. So so what's guiding us as we go to be witnesses, if I'm going to go be his witness and I'm going to do that completely on my own power, how long is that going to last before I become tired, bitter? angry, upset, ready to slap everyone on the other cheek, right? The Bible says, turn the cheek, slap the other cheek. I'm slapping cheeks. If I'm doing that on my own power, it's going to fail quickly. So, so we need to plug into the source, to the power. Th this, this microphone, uh, I've, I've recently updated the batteries. I've got rechargeable batteries because we're constantly in and out of, I, I never know because I'm very cheap and I don't want to buy new batteries. So I wait till they die. I don't mind when they die right here in front of you all and they'll just put a new, uh, it's a fun, awkward moment. I love it. I mean, it's one of my favorite things we do. But I've recently got rechargeable batteries. You know how rechargeable back batteries work though? Yeah, see, I got to take them out of here and then plug them into a wall and recharge them. That's really scientific, and I'm sorry if that's too much for some of you, but that's what has to be done. So if next week I use these same this same microphone, but I don't plug it back into the wall and recharge it, what happens? How foolish I would be to be up there like, what in the world? I bought rechargeable batteries. They're not even working. Did you plug them in? No. They got to be, they got to be recharged. So let's plug into the source. Let's plug into the power. What's the power that you and I have as believers? The, how, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So we're going to, we're going to look at, if you want, if you're one who likes to check out quickly, let me give you something and then you can check out. Oh, I feel sorry for you, but, but here's where we go. Here's what we're looking at. The hovering 
the indwelling and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at the hovering and the indwelling and the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. A lot of scriptures to go with this today, but essentially what I want us to leave and to remember that we have the hovering, indwelling, empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. In between indwelling and empowering, we're going to have a little parenthesis to talk about the call upon us that if this is all true, then you and I are called to be living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so how do we live via the Holy Spirit? That's what we're going to look at. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. I'm just going to quote this one for you. It says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. We are in, we, we have this hovering and dwelling, empowering presence, the power of the Holy Spirit. Before we look at some of the ones in Acts, we're going to just bounce around to a couple of places because I think it's good to remind ourselves of things and maybe here for the first time, things that Jesus taught us and that the scripture teaches us about who the Holy Spirit is, how do we receive the Holy Spirit. So let's start there to just get ourselves in the same place. The, and, and it fits with this first category, the hovering presence of the Holy Spirit, which we see throughout scripture. Acts 1.8 said, Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. This like hovering presence over really how I would describe the birthing of the, of the early church. You are going to go out and be my witnesses. And as they're being witnesses, and as they're witnessing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we start to see churches coming up. We start to see groups huddling together and coming together in the name of Jesus Christ and going out and testifying. And so this Holy Spirit presence upon you is very important at that kind of early stage. The, the, I, I would take it as, I'm, I mean, I'm a bit of a helicopter dad, so it, Maria's almost 18, so I'm still hovering over her. But it's really important at, the, at those early ages, right? You're, you're hovering over that brand new little baby. And and as much as I want to hover and be a helicopter dad, when you're when you're turning 18, I, I don't have many choices, right? I mean, I, I've, hopefully I've been empowering and equipping and, and teaching and guiding you, and, and I've got to... I gotta let go, and, and you and you got and you gotta move beyond. But those first years, they're so important to me. That hovering kind of presence, and so I see that it's so much when God's doing something new. We see that verbiage used a lot about the Holy Spirit coming upon seventy different times in the Book of Acts. The Holy Spirit is mentioned seventy times in twenty-eight chapters. The Holy Spirit is mentioned. It's used more in Acts. The Holy Spirit is talked about more in Acts than any other book in the Bible. The second most, I, I asked it as a guessing game of first service. I won't do that. We'll keep moving quickly here. But the second most is 1 Corinthians, which if you know anything about 1 Corinthians and the stuff that was going on in the church in Corinth, 43 times in 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit is referred to, which I think is interesting to note as well, because the church in Corinth was going through some problems, right? They had a lot of different things they were trying to navigate and figure out. And so I think it's interesting that Paul is reminding and mentioning and teaching and talking about the Holy Spirit a lot. The next closest you're going to find are a few books in the 20s where they talk about the Holy Spirit. So 70 times in the book of Acts, that's noteworthy to me. That, that's noteworthy. And why? Because I think, again, in the language I would use, is that God is birthing something through these apostles, these disciples, that's starting this early formation of the church. And it's an important season at this young stage of what the church is going to be. So let's be reminded of the hovering presence of the Holy Spirit, which you see clear back into the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, 1 to 2. If you like turning and you feel bad because you can't follow along as quickly as somebody else, there's a good one for you. It's the first two verses of the entire Bible. Go all the way back to the beginning, Genesis 1, 1 to 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was doing what? Hovering over the face of the waters. I love that word of that hovering kind of presence. It's not in any oppressive kind of way, but it's a protective kind of way of a nurturing, protective, hovering and taking care of. And what a beautiful picture in the, in the formation of the earth and the world and the heavens and all that God was creating, what's the Holy Spirit's role being described as? Hovering over. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Acts 1.8. Hovering over, if you will. We did this one a couple of weeks or a few weeks ago, Luke chapter 1. 
in the birth narrative of Mary. Could I trouble somebody in the back for a, a, just one of those little bottles of water? I'm not going to make it. Uh, and maybe you could remove the cap for me. I'm a bit of a prima donna with things. I know I need a lot of need a lot done for me. Uh, that would help. Just any of them. Steve's already, I feel bad. Steve's going to come in here and already got it. I feel bad. So uh, Luke chapter 135, ignore what's happening here right now. I just need, I'm just a little thirsty. And the angel answered her, Luke 135. Mary had just asked, how will this be, this news that I'm going to give birth to a baby? I've, I'm, I've, I'm a virgin. And the an angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So the empowering presence, oh, that, 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 that worked even better. <laughs> now I see this is, I just I went all over my arm and my sleeve and it's in my armpit right now. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I love these little bottles of water. You just naturally... <clears throat> I gotta stay focused. I gotta stay focused. Sorry. <clears throat> Um, man, I couldn't wait to be here this morning. I don't know why. I just couldn't, and I'm so excited. When I get excited, my mind gets going. I think I'm funny, and stuff just happens. So I apologize if if this is too much for you. Yeah, I totally lost where we were. Luke 135. So th this empowering presence of the Spirit, that before you even talk, and dwelling and empowering, hovering over at what? At, at the birth of Jesus Christ. I love that description, that the Spirit of God, Mary, is going to hover over you. How is this going to be? Well, I got this big news, or this thing's going to happen, and I really feel that the Spirit is leading me to it. How is this going to happen? How would this be? The Holy Spirit is hovering over you. I mean, every, every, everywhere that you go, for, for a different reason, I was, I, I drew my kids yesterday, or uh, pointed my kids to, um, oh, 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 what's it, uh, uh, Charlie Brown, uh, Pigpen, Pigpen, remember when Pigpen would walk, I did for, I did for, sorry, first person didn't get this, just put to my mind, I was showing my kids Pigpen, and just would walk that cloud of, like, dust all around him when he's walking, like, it's that, like, it's just hovering all around me, now, in Pigpen's, like, no one wanted to be around you, but if you're, if you're hovered by the Holy Spirit, people will not want to be around you, too, for some reason, but ought to be some joy and kindness and love they don't be drawing people in too you see what I'm saying right so the hovering presence of the Holy Spirit, Acts 1-8, Genesis 1, 1-2, and Luke 1, 35, the, the, the Spirit is hovering around, protecting, caring, and nurturing for, but it gets even better than that. Jesus tells the disciples that I am coming, or I am leaving, and the Holy Spirit is coming, and coming to be with you, and will actually do what? Move from hovering, dwell inside of you. John chapter 14. I'll, I'll just be honest as we're turning here. I'm completely out of order from what I did it in the first service, but it just feels like it's flowing so much better. So I praise God for that, or, or I, don't, I don't know what happened. That's a good taco you had, and it helped. John 14, here we go, 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper or counselor, your, your text may say, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It gets even better. The hovering presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this gift, this gift of the counselor, the comforter that will be with you and will be inside of you. John chapter 16. Jesus, again, still talking to the disciples. This one amazes me. I, I can't, every time I read it, it just... Uh, verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, talking to the disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the counselor, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Uh, here's Jesus saying... <laughs> I'm walking right with you, right, right beside you, face to face. I can see you. And Jesus looks at the disciples and he tells them, it is better for you. It is to your advantage that I leave you. Because when I leave you, he will come and he will live inside of you. He will be with you and he will live inside of you. He will convict. He will remind. He will guide you. 
That's what Jesus' exact words were to the disciples. It's better for you that I'm not walking with you right now because when I leave, I'm sending you a gift. The Holy Spirit that will live inside of you. So this hovering presence moves inside of us. Every time I have to do it, I have to pause and say it. It's a Francis Chanism. I love it. I heard him say it years ago, and it's one of my favorite things when you think about this. He said, can you imagine someday you and I walking into heaven? And then we walk into heaven, and we, I can't wait to talk to Moses. I can't wait to see Peter. Man, what was it like? What was it like, Peter, to like walk with Jesus? I guess I got to know, and he's like, Peter's going to be like, stop, stop. Like Before we even talk about that, you have to tell me what it was like to have the Holy Spirit, the presence of God living inside of you, because that must have been amazing. Right? Like, we're so like, man, I wish I could have walked with Jesus. And he's saying, I think they're going to look at us and say, I wish I could have had the presence of God live inside of me. You are the lucky ones. And how many of us as Christians kind of hear that and are like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I have no idea what you're talking about. And, and that's part of the problem. That we're not tapped into the source. The hovering presence moves to the indwelling presence. Again, just as we're moving back to Acts, again, the order of this has come together so much better. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. We're, lead, we're heading right back to Acts. Well, never mind. We skipped over Acts. We're going to go back to Acts after this. But Ephesians 1, verse 13. I, I think it's important to remind ourselves today, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? A lot of f places teach a variety of things when it comes to the Holy Spirit, which is one of the reasons that it brings a little bit of anxieties and, and fears and when, when we start talking Holy Spirit, stuff's going to get weird. And, and I just don't see a weird presence within the scripture. I see a powerful presence of, of this empowering presence of God inside of us. Ephesians 1.13 tells us this. The question is, so how do I receive the Holy Spirit? How does that take place? What happens? Ephesians 1.13, it says, In him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him. So I'm now believing in Jesus Christ. I heard the gospel. When I believe in him, I reach out in faith to Jesus. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Everything to the praise of his glory in Ephesians 1. When I believed, when I've heard the message of Jesus Christ, I believed in the gospel. It says what? I received a gift again. I was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So, you probably hope, I hope a bunch of you have it written in your Bibles right there. I'm signed, sealed, delivered. I'm his. The promised Holy Spirit who is a guarantee of my inheritance, of what is still yet to come, all for the praise of his glory. So the hovering presence of God, I reach out in faith to Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of me. And I have this indwelling Holy Spirit. The hovering spirit indwells, indwelling now inside of me. And let's pause then before we finish with the empowering presence to talk about what does it mean to live by the Holy Spirit? Because we are called to live life living by the Holy Spirit. Now let me tell you what I'm about to do. It's, it's, it's not confusing. If it's in the notes in your bulletin. I was reading through Acts 70 different times the Holy Spirit. So I wanted to jot down all 70 of them and so what was happening. As I jotted them down, they, they all kind of fell into three categories of, of, the, of the, the kind of ways in which we're called to live life by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to give you 70 of them. I'm just going to give you a handful of these references. But they all fell into three categories and all three of those categories reminded me of something that the Apostle Paul had taught us. So I categorized each of these, how we live life by the Spirit, by the teaching of the Apostle Paul. So don't turn to the headings of these. Ephesians 5.18, first category. Paul says, don't, don't get drunk with wine, for it leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul will talk often about be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. It's one of the most common references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. The people of God were filled with the Holy Spirit. So Acts chapter 1 now. Are you good? Everybody with me still? 
Acts chapter 1, verse 2, or 1 and 2. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So Jesus was giving commands, it says, through what? Through the Holy Spirit, being filled with, being being moved by the indwelling Holy Spirit. I put a side note reference, let me just fro- say it to you, but in Luke chapter 4, you have the description of Jesus Christ because everything that we just read about the Holy Spirit's presence in the life of the church and Mary from the beginning was same of Jesus' ministry. In Luke chapter 4, as Jesus was beginning his earthly ministry, it says in Luke 4, 1, that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, filled with the Holy Spirit, and returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the same hovering and dwelling picture that we just talked about, we see in the life of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 4, and Acts 1, 2 here says, Jesus was teaching through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. These are just all in the category of we're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, follow along with the bulletin or grab one later or see me if you didn't get one. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 tells us this. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, did what? Spoke. If he, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Acts 4, 31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to do what? Speak the word of God with boldness. There was something about the filling of the Holy Spirit in their lives that caused them to then go from that place and to speak, to testify, to give witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to speak with boldness. Acts chapter chapter, uh, let's do Acts chapter 6, 10, 6 verse 10. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. He was speaking, filled by the Holy Spirit, and they could not withstand the wisdom and the power with which he was speaking. There was something about his words that were not like anything else we had seen. Remember when we started Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by my power, but by the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. There was something unique and different than the ways in which the disciples were speaking that people couldn't quite grasp and understand because it was like nothing they had ever seen. Hovering presence of the Spirit now living inside, being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking for God. What a beautiful picture of what the calling of the church and Christians today are. Second category, in terms of living by the Spirit, we're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, again, don't go with Ephesians 4 here, but Ephesians 4.30 says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So I looked at, as I was looking at the categories that were happening within the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, verse 3, we talk grieving the Holy Spirit. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm wondering why God's not moving in my life, why things aren't happening. It might be because I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit. Acts 5 verse 3 gives us a wonderful example of this. It's not a wonderful example, but it's a practical example of how this happens. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? If you remember the story, Ananias and Sapphira, so Sapphira sold a piece of their property and they kept back for themselves some of the proceeds that brought it before the church and kind of came to church like this. Like They, didn't, they were holding back for themselves selves. They were lying. And a lot of times we come in before God and presence of God and we're hiding some stuff. We're keeping stuff back as if God doesn't know, but we're hiding it behind our backs, which is really comical to stand before God who does know everything. And notice the verbiage though. You're lying to the Holy Spirit right now. Why are you doing this? And then we might wonder, God, why aren't you blessing this? God, why is this not happening the way I think it should happen? God, why is this not going the way? Uh, Is there a way in which I'm grieving the Holy Spirit? 
So we're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve with the Holy Spirit. Again, all of this under that heading of I'm called to live by the Spirit. How do I live by the Spirit? I got to be filled with the Spirit. I got to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, the last one that category, Galatians 5.25, Paul says, if we say we live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. If we say, I live by the Spirit, live by the Spirit of God, but yet I never go in the ways in which God is directing and calling me. I am I really living life by the Spirit? I'm with you. I'm going with you. And I head the other direction. So, Acts chapter 11, verse 12. <laughs> Again, uh, one of the other dominant themes that you will see throughout the book of Acts is the ways in which they were keeping in step with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Acts 11 verse 12 tells us this. The Spirit told me to go with him, making no distinction. The Spirit told Peter to go, to go with these guys, and all this early thing that was happening within the church. All these verses have a greater surrounding context we don't have time to look at. But the point here is that he was being directed and told by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit said to go, and what did Peter do? He went. If you say jump, I'll say how high, or I'm diving in. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 10. Acts 16, verses 6 to 10. Love the description here. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, when they had come upon Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and to help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This picture of we were being forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go here. We we're being nudged and called and directed by the Holy Spirit to go over here. And so we're just following the leading of the Holy Spirit to the places that he was calling us to go. Acts 17, verse 16. While Paul was writing for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. He's going into this city and he's saying, there is so much in here that it's just not right. And my spirit is telling me there's something that's just not right about this. And he's provoked within his spirit that this is wrong. If you have that feeling, right, there's just something wrong. There's something not right here. Where the spirit is leading and directing and guiding maybe to go in a place. The other times the spirit is directing and to stop. Don't go there. There's something just not right about this. And I can't maybe put a finger on it, but it is not right. And Paul's looking around saying, this is not right and there's a conviction and guess what he did he spoke Acts chapter 20 one more <clears throat> Acts chapter 20 verse 22 Acts 20 verse 22 says and now behold I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Holy Spirit compelled by convicted by not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not consider, consider or account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The Apostle Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm compelled. I'm moved. I'm controlled by the leading of the Spirit. And I'm going to Jerusalem. I have no idea what awaits me there. I'm not sure, but I do know this, that the Holy Spirit is warning me, telling me, testifying to me that in every city that I'm going to go in, persecution, pain, tribulation, difficulties, and imprisonment is waiting me. Would you be going to those places knowing that the Holy Spirit is just warning and telling me ahead of time, just giving you a heads up, hey, I'm calling you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to go. Will you go? Sure, I'll go. I'll follow you to Jerusalem. Just FYI, what's waiting you there, and I'm not giving you specifics, but it's basically beatings and persecution and difficulties and mockings and people not liking you and probably throwing you into prison. Okay, I'll go. He's going, why though? Because he said, I'm compelled by, I'm constrained by, I'm moved by the Holy Spirit. I'm following the leading of the Holy Spirit and I don't consider my life to be worth anything. I'm just here to follow God and to testify the gospel of God's grace. That's my life. 
What a powerful, powerful section of scripture. So you and I are called the hovering Holy presence of the Holy Spirit is indwelling inside of us as believers of God. We're called to live by the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to not grieve the Holy Spirit and to keep in step where the Spirit is leading us. I, I, I know that's a lot. I, I pray you take some time with that. Read those scriptures again. Wrestle with that. I heard somebody say yesterday that we've got to stop listening to the sermons we're preaching in our own minds. And we got to start preaching the word of God to ourselves. Stop listening into the sermons or the messages that keep getting repeated. We got to start preaching the word of God to ourselves. I got to know this word and I got to keep reminding myself of this and keep coming back to it. That's how I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Anything that's in my getting in the way, something I know, am I holding something back right now? Start of the new year. Am I holding something back? Am I hiding something before God? Maybe it's time to bring that to light before God, to confess that, to give it to God. God, I got to get rid of this. I got to take this away. I think I'm grieving the Holy Spirit. And I got to give that over to you. Where you say go, I'm going to go. And I want to be sensitive to your leading every day and to pray about that and to ask your guidance every morning when I start out my day. God, what, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to speak to? What do you want me to hear? If somebody's coming to me to bring me something, I want to hear it. I want to hear what you have to say. Protect me from lies. Protect me from evil and deceitfulness and people that just want to harm and hurt. And I want to be guided by you and to be led by you. And I want to pray that every day. I want to be guided by your word. I want to be guided by your Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with and I want to keep in step with where you're going. When you say jump, I say how high. It's time to go. Not, not quite yet. <laughs> Last thing we'll come back to then the empowering presence of the Spirit. So, so it's the hovering presence of the Holy Spirit who then lives and dwells inside of us as believers and as believer knowing that I have the indwelling presence of the Spirit. I'm trying to walk by the Spirit's guidance. I'm call, called to live by Him but I want to be reminded today as we leave. Last thing to leave knowing it's the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit that we have living inside of us. That the Apostle Paul said, let me let me just summarize it for you so we run, as we're running a little late on the time. Ephesians chapter 1, 15 to 20. We say this one a lot here. It's Apostle Paul's prayer to the church to say, I am praying constantly for you. I don't cease to give thanks and prayer for you. And part of his prayer is, is that the eyes of our hearts would be opened, that they would be enlightened, that you would know the power that lives inside of you which is the same power that he used to raise God used to raise his son Jesus from the dead lives inside of you Paul says I am praying constantly that the eyes of your hearts would be open that you would know the power that lives inside of you you will be filled with power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses you know what the Greek word for power is? Dunamis. I got this text the other day. Uh, band, you can just come up again. From our residential poet, prophet, preacher, Priscilla Lewis. And I told her, I'm like, I'm going to read this at the end of the sermon. This is, this is amazing. Soul Minor, it is called. She wrote this. Reading the notes ahead for this week's sermon, she wrote this about Acts 1-8. In 1867, Alfred Noble received a U.S. patent on the invention, in the, in the invention of dynamite. His invention allowed great headway to be made in the mining industry. Miners no longer had to rely on crude, inefficient tools like the pickaxe to access the wealth of coal, gold, and other minerals. They now could put the power of dynamite to use to blast their way through hard rock. They could gain entry into the heart of a mountain and harvest its treasures. It's interesting. In the same way, the power of the Holy Spirit can enter into the hard heart of man. In Acts 1.8, Jesus tells the disciples, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. The Greek word used here for power is dunamis, which is the root word noble used for dynamite. 
the significance of this power is that spiritually speaking, all men who have received the Holy Spirit, the ability to move the mountain of the rigid edges of a hard heart, they can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, become soul miners. Back in the day when coal miners traversed deep into the mines, it was standard procedure to drill several holes, then insert dynamite and light the fuse. And as they would run for cover against the power of the blast, they would yell out, fire in the hole. In a similar way, when the Holy Spirit enters into the heart, believers should shout out, fire in the soul. I messed that up in first service, and I said, fire in the hole still. She corrected me. <laughs> Priscilla, if you're in here, it does read soul. I, don't, I, I told her, it read hole. You messed it up. My fault. In the Gospel of Matthew, John the Baptist testifies that Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Believers should be longing to be souls on fire for Jesus. He showed us the way. We can move in miraculous ways and with power. We only need to follow him light the fuse and through the power of the Holy Spirit be his witnesses so far as our life can reach but go in the power of the Spirit and be a soul miner through the Spirit that lives in the heart move the mountain set before you and let your soul be on fire for the Lord we have the empowering presence of God dynamite dunamis that lives inside of us of you and I as believers the hovering presence of God that I believe is still all over everything that you and I are never walking outside of the will of our Father in heaven that whatever you and I will face this year his hovering presence is still there wherever we go like this umbrella that I carry with me but even better I know he's dwelling inside of me and living inside of me which is the same power that my eyes and my heart need to be open to to realize that's the same power he used to raise Jesus from the dead is living inside of me so I gotta I gotta walk in that I, I have like 5,000 movies that are just like tucked away in my head. So I know this is completely random. But first service, all I could think about was Beverly Hills Cop. Eddie Murphy, he's doing like a fake on people trying to get in things. He was pretending he had dynamite in a box and he came walking into this room like this. <laughs> Don't talk. Man, I feel like when I go to McDonald's today, I got to walk in like this. I usually walk out like that. Like, Lord, help me. I walk in like this and someone's going, what's wrong with you? I am so filled with dynamite today. Stuff's just going to explode. Man, I actually say that when you go to McDonald's just see what happens <laughs> if you had any idea of what's living inside of me I feel like I'm gonna explode <laughs> that the power of God lives inside of me and just and I can't handle it tomorrow when somebody like cuts me off on the way to work it just wrecks the rest of my day like we gotta start looking at it like that you and I have the same power living inside of us that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. Man, this year, let's walk in that. This is not a guilt trip. I, I'm just as guilty as anyone of tomorrow my world will be wrecked because when I ordered the, like, super size, they gave me the king, whatever. Stupid stuff. And let's walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power lives inside of you and me hovering indwelling empowering presence of God let's stand together let's close with this prayer and song together being reminded of the power of God that lives inside of us we're called to be witnesses wherever we go today not by our own power not by our own might but by the power of God living inside of us amen father thank you for your son Jesus Christ thank you for the wonderful gift of the mercy and grace and love that you have given to us in your son and thank you father for the washing and renewal and regeneration of your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us Thank you for all these gifts. Open the eyes of our hearts today, Father, that we might see and know and live for you 
in ways we never have before. Holy Spirit, hover over this place in this church. As believers in Christ, remind us of your indwelling presence and remind us as we go of your empowering presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and all God's people said.